Okay, welcome to the Metropolitan again. I tried this last week and it didn't quite work out the way I wanted to. The camera just wasn't holding steady. So I'm taking a little bit more time to do this this time and we're going to be less ambitious. And uh, we're heading up to the European uh, art section, which was just recently reinstalled. There's a ton of um, paintings up there, more than I could possibly fit in this video. In theory, they've rearranged them. But my experience in the rearrangement from looking at them twice now is that I can't tell of any improvement that they've made uh, with the rearrangements. But it is nice to see the uh, masterpieces uh, back in place, although there's a lot of European art there that uh, I don't particularly find um, uh, special, uh, especially from the uh, 1700s and the 1800s, uh, England, Spain, the 1300s, and so on and so forth. Um, the Metropolitan doesn't really succeed uh, or excel in those areas, but it does excel with the Dutch masters. And, um, several other uh, important uh, European sections. So uh, I'm going to just try to focus in a little bit better this time, but we will walk up the staircase. This is the grand staircase. And I am going to walk up the staircase so that you can get the feeling of what it's like to come to the Met and make this trip. And then after we get done with the staircase, I'm going to go directly to the... Um, to the Rembrandts, which is where I left off last time, but I'm just going to go straight to them this time. The last videos just were too shaky to handle. Hopefully this anti-shake is on and this whole thing will work out this time. And we'll get a quality, quality video. Canon is much better at this, but um, I'm doing it this way anyway because this camera has much bigger videos. I'm hoping it'll work this time. Um, in theory, they've changed this from doing it by each country to doing it by time, and I started last time in that direction. And uh, I don't know how they do it by time. These are early pieces, obviously, with um, a lot of tree sips and so on. I'll just give you a taste of this. The Netherlandish painter, 5th century mystery of the Virgin from 1500. I don't waste too much time with this though. <coughs> if you really want to see these or this kind of paintings, you really got to go to London where they have this. Kind of portraiture. Okay, so we want to go to. I'm going to walk over here. You know, Christian art geography. We're going to walk past this. Well, this painting's a little bit interesting. I'll we'll get a shot of this one. This is, um, you know, before they really mastered perspective, they had some of these early um, architectural works, which almost got the perspectives perfect. Not quite. They were working on it. And this is Tempera, uh, Giovanni. This painting probably should get more attention than it does, but whatever. 
In any event, let's continue. Of course, I made a wrong turn here. But I'll get to where I want to go anyway. We're Nothing like a few nudes to, to make the day. This is Titian's workshop. If you want to see a lot of Titian's, the place to go is the Prada, for whatever it's worth. But um, in Spain and in Madrid, it's worth the trip, by the way, just to see that museum. But this is his workshop, even. It's not really, I don't think, pure titian. You know, this one, you see, you feel like every museum you go to, you find this painting. So uh, Titian seemed to like this painting because he did it over and over and over and over and over and over again at various sizes. This one's smallish. This is the Macy's gallery. I don't know. The Macy's would approve of this gallery, but whatever. Just doing a quick look around here. Not what we're looking for. I'm looking for 616. That's where we're going to start. This one's interesting. This is an early work. Uh, Originio, Girl with Cherries. Okay, now, this is from Italy. And I don't, this can't be, I don't think this is oil, this is probably fresco. But, um, this is oil and wood. All right, if they say so. What's interesting here is uh, fourteen ninety two. You know, it's post Leonardo, and you can see his influence with the smoking, the smoke effect on the um, on the uh, you know eyes and the highlight and the, the shading. What I find interesting here is the cherries. You, you see the attempt here to get the hands right, which they, which is a hard thing. You know, hard hands that make them feel natural, hair that it looks right. You know, they tried. Um, he's a moderate artist, so to speak. You know, he's wouldn't, wouldn't you wouldn't put him up there with Da Vinci. Got this nude over here. Let's see if we get this one. The, this is a, the, you know, the problem with this one, there is no problem with it, it's fine. But it, I'm comparing it to my experience with the uh, Crowler Manolo Museum where they have life size paintings of this ilk um, from 1520s or so, um, maybe earlier even. Anyway, this is also Giovanni. Uh, not what we're looking for, but we're getting there. Okay, this is closer. This is Jockey. 
and um, just want to get one look at this. It is kind of cool. You have to, you know, no TV, no movies or anything like this. They used these as devotionals, and they really believed that they had magic powers. So the painters had magic powers of sorts. This, uh, when you open this up like this, it almost looks like you're opening up a window into a world that, that background that he did uh, is an early example of decent landscape, very decent landscape. This is one of the better pieces of work actually in the museum, in this section of the museum. Um, perspective is interesting because it's, uh, each one has their own perspective as if this is open, it's supposed to be open like such as it is, not flat, but like three quarters. And uh, it's, a, it's a lovely work in and of itself. You can see um, changing influences at this point. I'm just gonna move on. Now, this is The Harvesters by Brogel. This is very significant work. Um, Brogel was world famous, him and his son, even by this time, and he did work with Rubens. Um, they, uh, he, he took the time out to do uh, everyday people, peasants, and so on, and um, not just uh, aristocracy. And look at that wonderful landscape into the background. You can see the entire waterfront with ships coming in. Um, the tree is typical of Brogel. It's not perfect, but it's artistic in its own right. And of course, you see um, personality in uh, most of the uh, most of the peasants. Color is terrific. This is worth seeing in person. This piece. Okay, and let's just move on into the Rembrandt room. Okay, so here's the main Rembrandt room, 616. And I'll take some stills from here also. Um, they haven't had all their Rembrandts out until now. Um, their most famous Rembrandt is uh, that one over there, which is uh, supposed to be... Um, Aristotle, or Socrates, I forget. Aristotle, that's what it is actually. Um, they have a, a very famous collection of Rembrandts. And overall, the quality of them is uh, very high. Um, although, you can probably find better examples of specific Rembrandts in various places. The London Museum, the art galleries have a tremendous collection of Rembrandts. Some of the most fantastic ones, actually. Of course, the Rijks Museum has, uh, you know, the Night Watch among also um, the Jewish Brides. So that's probably the cream of the crop. But the but the Met has got really a, a, a wonderful collection. But of them all, I like this one the best. And it's, it's a pleasure to see this. Um, now, there's a little bit of a story behind this. This uh, is supposed to be Aphrodite, and the um, shield has uh, Medusa on it. And uh, there was a bit of a friendly competition, or maybe not so friendly, between Rubens and uh, Rembrandt. And Ru Rubens did a fantastic uh, uh, Medusa. And what happened was Rembrandt decided that he could do it better. But instead of doing it in full color, he just did it as a silver ornamentation on this shield, um, which looks just fabulous. The illusion is, the illusion on this shield is not like anything I've ever seen anywhere else in any other piece of work of art. Um, the jewels are just, um, when you come up close to them, are um, abstract, it, you know, you don't, you, you know, you don't see all of the light, or all, there's no attempt here to, to paint every line here, and to leave the illusion to the eye. 
And uh, the Dutch were really masters at this. They had really started to figure out about the effects of human optics and, uh, and light. But the, uh, the uh, Medusa in silver is just fabulous. The white highlights are perfect. I mean, they really are perfect. This jumps out at you in huge three dimensions, even though it's two dimensional, obviously. Uh, it's a flat painting. There's no, uh, you know, lifting of the paint here like you might see on other works. Um, and uh, the effect is just stunning. It makes Disney eat its heart out. All right? And then you have this, the metal of her brothel or her whatever you want to call that, the, not brothel, but uh, her shirt or whatever you want to call that. And then that's obviously copper highlights up there on that top. I just love this painting. I really do. The background, like most Rembrandts, is somewhat faded because of the varnishing that's been done over decades, over, over centuries at this point. You wonder, you know, we're lucky to have Rembrandts because the varnish just keeps getting darker and darker. Eventually, something usually has to be done about it. And I'm going to show you another example where the painting has been largely destroyed by the darkening of the varnish. But um, we are living in a time and place where we still have access to, uh, to them. Yeah. Now, moving along, this is uh, got a sister painting over at the Rijksmuseum. It says, Portrait of a Young Woman with a Fan. I find it hard to believe they really don't know who this is because um, I, seem to, I think I recognize this woman from other Rembrandt paintings, but maybe it's just I've been here so many times that I see it here. But. Um, He uses, he's done similar works to this in other, in other museums that you'll see. Uh, the Tripper uh, portrait at the Rijksmuseum is probably uh, the most famous of them. Uh, her eyes in that painting are just fabulous. And the eyes in this painting, maybe not so much, but what you, what you should take really notice here is, and what makes Rembrandt excel even at this stage of his life, this painting was Let's see, 1633, so it's relatively early in his career, in the middle of his, of his early part of his career, I'd say. And um, the hands are always delightful. Both Franz Hals and Rembrandt do amazing work with the hands. They just are so natural and expressive. And the lace. Um, and you'll see different kinds of uh, um, techniques used to do lace. When you stand back, the lace looks, um, you know, very realistic. Uh, but as you're closer to it, it gets a little bit uh, more, um, uh, abstract in the painting. Try to figure, like if you're standing about this close to the painting, trying to paint this and how difficult it is, try to figure out what the painting is going to look like when you stand back seven feet from it. It's, it's, that is part of the brilliance of the talent. These laces are brilliant, of course, because it's Rembrandt, uh, but they're not quite like what you'll see um, in, in the abstraction of them uh, in the later works that he did with this lace. And there's the pearls. Let me just get a look at her face. I'm not tall enough. It's the expression in the face that also just sets them apart. You can see that the two different eyes usually are going in different directions because we don't have perfect symmetry. And so he doesn't attempt to do this perfect symmetry. In fact, that's, uh, you can usually tell a real Rembrandt when the eyes are a little goofy, actually. But um, he, he does them just so that they're off enough to give a real sense of reality to the, uh, to the, to the painting. 
Okay. Go to the, once again, to step back. All right. Moving along here. This is one of my favorites. This is, by Rembrandt standards, this is a huge painting. I have to step back to this. Um, he, this fellow is in several Rembrandt paintings. He's got, he's with this one in the, in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, with the guy with the feather, you know, which is a fabulous feather. Um, I don't know who uh, the model is exactly. I'm sure they've researched this. Um, these costumes that he wears uh, came out of Rembrandt's arsenal in his house. He had, um, he put himself basically in hock uh, and destroyed his finances by buying tons of uh, artistic things that he could use in paintings and so on and so forth from various centuries and so on and so forth. He was a huge collector and he just put himself right into uh, poverty, you know, until he lost his house and everything. Um, but this is uh, an example with the turban and the uh, just beautiful, bellowing, luscious coat. I'm not sure exactly, you know, my impression is it's, it's, it, it was some type of wall. Um, and again, with the hand, just a very, very, very nice hand. And, th and this fellow has marvelous eyes. And again, you can see one eye is a little bit lower than the one on the on our right or his left, and the other one is higher up. Asymmetrical eyes, which give this an extraordinary feel to the uh, to the uh, emotionality of the painting, where you catch a moment of this guy's uh, uh, of his of his thinking process. And it really breathes life into him. And this is what Rembrandt did that, that was better than anybody else's capability of doing it was just to bring these uh, two dimensional paintings to life um, and catching the moment of intellectual thought on the face of the, of the uh, character. It was more important for him probably to get the emotional status or state that he wanted of the character than even getting you know, a pictorial perfection of it. Um, and so this becomes uh, more important as we go along. All right, let's continue on over here. This is one of my favorites, but unfortunately, this is the painting I was referring to before that has had been basically washed out by the varnish over time. Um, it was very likely that the woman that's in the background, this is supposed to be a bit Sheva, and somewhere in the upper right hand, or in the upper left hand corner, it's supposed to be uh, King David looking down on her while she's bathing. A very famous story that uh, Rembrandt liked to do from the Bible. The um, mother of Solomon. Um, the uh, skin tone is, 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 is so different. It was funny that the Italian painters said Rembrandt is the, is, is the man who, drew, who paints the ugly women in the north. That's how they looked at him. Um, I, they obviously didn't seem to understand. Um, and to the modern eye, maybe also they don't understand, but you have to look, uh, when you get used to looking at it, um, and familiar with the, uh, with, uh, with Dutch painting in general, and these in specific, you start to begin to understand, um, just, uh, how nice these are, uh, you know, these women have their own beauty. In their, in, their, in their person and the way they handle their entire body. Um, it's, it's really quite interesting. But you completely lost to the varnish aging, the background of David up there. He's supposed to be up there somewhere, I don't see it. Even my camera can't adjust for this. My, uh, my still camera automatically sometimes fixes the darkness 